So, hi there, friends. My name's Eli. I'm one of the co-hosts of the CMX Connect chapter here. This one's focused really on the needs of people who run chapter groups and user-led groups. And that's what I do for a living. I actually work for TechSoup, a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits use technology. And I manage this global network of uh, volunteer-led Tech for Good meetups. Super fun. Um, I'm always delighted to get together with other people who are nerdy about the same kind of stuff that I am. I also have a co-host here who is all just in the chat today, which is Tali. But I don't know she's actually the ringleader and, and mastermind behind this whole chapter and really founded it. And I'm just sort of stepping in today because she's got a family Passover uh, dinner that's going on today. Let's start up. We've got four expert panelists with us today. I could fake telling the bios for them, but honestly, I'll make a hash of it. So I'm going to put them on the spot and have them introduce themselves. And so let's start that off really quickly, just three sentences. Who are you? What's your organization? And what is the user group that you're part of? Kat, I'm going to have you go first. Happy to kick things off. So, hey everyone, so nice to virtually meet all of you. My name is Kat Martinez. I am our Senior Manager of Community Programs over at ThoughtSpot. I'm overseeing a lot of our customer programs, which are including, which have been a passion of mine for the past three to four years now, and excited to share some of my experience and hopefully some of you guys could take away what I've learned about working with partners here today. I'll kick it over to Aaron here to introduce himself next. Thanks, Kat. I'm Aaron Weitz. I work for Anaplan. We make a, a business planning platform that enables better decision making through data visibility and modeling. It's super nerdy. But I run our communities groups program globally and am like everybody else here, super excited to be nerdy about groups. I'll pass to Maria. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Maria Alcantara. I work uh, for Camunda. We orchestrate programs everywhere, automate them, community manager there, and responsible for the user groups as well, like all these other awesome colleagues. And it's a, a, a challenge and fun times always trying to make the best for them in a very distributed and virtual world. So yeah, happy to be here. And over to Katarina. Well, hi everyone, I'm Katarina Pereira. I'm a community event specialist at OutSystems, a local platform. And yep, same as everyone else, I've been working with the user groups for the past few years and excited to be here and to hear what everyone has to say about the, the programs. I love doing events with other community managers because you just step in and pass the baton by yourself. You're the best, thank you. We, as when we, when we run user groups, we're often looking for people to jump in to, to participate. And obviously some of the people who are most incentivized to participate are the partners of our organizations, which is awesome, but also sometimes a little bit worrying because we want to say, are their incentives totally aligned with the needs of our community? So we often want to be a little bit cautious around that. But before we go too deeply into this, I just want to get a sense of what does partner actually mean at your organization when you think about user groups? Are these business partners? Are these people just out there in like outside consultancies? Like, I'd love to get a good sense of that. Let's, let's talk with you. What does a partner mean in your organization? Sorry, Elijah, like you called me, right? Yeah, sorry, that was you. Sorry, yeah. my internet was just like, it cut and I was like, cut. I oh, thought so my apologies. Between me so or Kat, sorry. Was, yeah, what, could you just give me a definition of what does partner mean in your organization? We have multiple types of partners. So we have everything from people that actually can resell out systems to training partners. So people that are authorized to deliver training programs or technology alliance partners. So people that create reusable open codes that are accessible to everyone through our platform or education. So we have a lot of different partners within out systems. So it's sometimes difficult to define just one because we have multiple, but it's mainly people that are, that can re, I forgot the word, sorry, that can resell our platform or that can mm -hmm. sometimes represent out systems without being from out systems. And are you encouraging those people to actively participate in your user group programs or are they just doing it by themselves? We, it depends. So we've done 
both in the past. So we have a few people from partners that know of the program and are excited to be part of it and that they automatically submit their application to become an organizer. But sometimes if we have a location that we don't have an organizer yet, we reach out to our partner success team and we ask them for reference of people that could be interested in leading these groups. So we have a bit of both. I'm seeing Aaron nod a little bit. Does that sound like a similar story to you? Very similar. Yeah. Usually when we're talking about partners, we're talking about implementation partners who can not necessarily resell in a plan, but help deploy it at customers as a third party consultancy or other form of organization. So that they help expand our, our business in that way. And similarly, there are many of them that are eager to participate in these groups and have always wanted to be able to participate, whether we've allowed them or not, and others who just aren't focused on that. And so sometimes have had to be drawn in. Yeah, no, I totally hear that. And Kat, for you, what does partners look like and how are they participating? Yeah, so for us, very similar to what Gata was sharing about OutSystems at ThoughtSpot, we're looking at partners anywhere from some of our consulting partners, those are that are providing training services, the implementation side of things. And when we think of those partners, we also actually align very closely with our partner marketing team, our channels team here internally, to get their insight about how these people can actually be a good fit for our community. I've seen that relying and leaning on that internal team that I have here, getting their insight of, hey, we are launching or looking to launch this user group in said location or said persona and industry. Does this person, does this partner, are they based in this location? Do they have this industry expertise? Do you think they would be a good fit? And so we've really had those internal connections before we expand into the external discussions of bringing on those partners. But I'm always in favor of bringing in partners because they do have the motivation, if you find it correctly, in making sure that they're supporting the community because they they also get qu quite involved in our community here by attending events, sourcing speakers, and just even being leaders too, which I'm sure we'll mm -hmm. get into a little bit later. Absolutely. And Maria, for you, what does partnerships look like for your organization? Well, it pretty much uh, is like everyone else has mentioned. So it's reselling from trainings as well. Sometimes it's they include Camunda in their custom build uh, solutions and they offer them. But most importantly, I think just to, to add a little uh, something different from what has been said so far, many of the partners are also, or before becoming partners, they've been very active community members and contributors. We are an open source program, solution, sorry. So before becoming a partner, they were very active contributors, as I said. So their journey uh, sometimes is uh, very particular. So I would sometimes say that they were first community members in a very pure sense of the word mm -hmm. and then became uh, partners. So that's really interesting. That path can go the other way. So instead yeah. of coming, the business needs lead into the partnerships. And sometimes you're like, my involvement with this community turned into a business because yeah. it because there was enough there that to actually start building something up. That's super yeah. interesting. We, we're now having more people wandering into the room. Delighted to have all of you here. We will definitely be stopping at several places through this session today where we'll take your questions. So my recommendation is to drop your questions into the chat. And then I will either read those questions out for you or twist your arm gently and ask you to come on camera if you're okay with that. So that will be the flow for Q&A here today. But I want to go back to what Kat was just talking about a moment ago, which is around this idea of setting expectations. Because when these partners come in, they may not be like some of the other community members. They, they do have these strong business needs. They they want to collect email addresses. They want to build their own ongoing relationships outside of your organization and your relationships with the members. And there can be sometimes a little bit of, of conflict there as much as they're also partners. And how do you go about setting that expectation when you have that conversation with a partner around being part of a user group? 
Yeah. And some of the expectations really start in the initial calls that I have with them during the onboarding period. So after I get insight from who I mentioned earlier, our partner marketing team or our channels team who are working very closely with these partners directly for the reselling or the training and implementation and such, I set up these one-on-one -on -one calls to really find out what their intrinsic motivation is to lead, speak, or participate in a user group. If they're interested in leading, then we take them through the same formal onboarding that we do for user group leaders where we go over the expectations, the requirements, and then of course down to the nitty gritty of why as a partner you have so much already, you're already involved with our organization, but why do you want to take this next step in expanding the community here? And a lot of times they say, hey, I see what my customers talk about on a day to day. I'm talking to customers here and there in this location. I want to bring them all together. So when I hear that kind of talk track of, hey, I want to bring these customers together, or I am able to be a resource to the community here through this user group sign for me saying, okay, they're in it for the good of the community. But when I hear things like, oh, I want to get our partner name across, I want to promote our services, or I'm potentially looking to increase our marketing opportunities here, then that's a red flag for me during these calls because that's saying, okay, maybe this isn't the best fit right now, but if you're looking for maybe some brand recognition, we're happy to talk about some alternatives such as hosting and providing mm. refreshments and foods. Depending on what I hear during that onboarding call and also presenting them our partner policy, which I've put together based on my experience of what I've had in past and interactions with partners here, it's really understanding what is motivating them. And if it's a good fit, then we move forward with them being a speaker or a user group leader. But if it's not, then just finding alternatives that also mm. may work for them so that we don't hinder that relationship either. Because as some of you may know, it's a tricky row when it comes to working with partners, but all, all, all in all, I still advocate for working with partners because they're overall so knowledgeable about your platform. They know your customer base pretty well, and they're able to really be a, lead, a resource to lean on for user groups. But, but yeah, that's really interesting that maybe being a full chapter leader is the right role. And maybe you're like, actually, maybe you just want to be a support to an existing chapter. Maybe you want to come in more of a sponsor or just like a one-off guest expert. So I think to have a, a menu of options so you because these are, as you say, more difficult relationships is yeah. is wise. Katarina, I saw you doing a little bit of nodding there too. Have you had some of these same difficult conversations of trying to navigate what is actually the appropriate role for a partner in your community? Yeah, so my experience is pretty similar to what Kat was mentioning. So we do have that first call with them where we set really clearly the, the expectations and the rules of the user groups, because we do have rules. And it's really important for us in particular to have uh, a safe, neutral place where everyone from the community can meet. As And, and we always try to make sure that everyone that's uh, participating as an organizer, as a leader of the user group, no matter if they're partners, if they're from customers, or if they're just community members, that they understand that they are participating as members of the community and not as a reflection of the company they work at. So we really try to make sure that this is clear to them from the start. And we also provide really clear examples of things that happened in the past and why we do have these guidelines so that they understand. So something that we do that usually helps a lot is when we say that we don't have any commercial purposes on these events. We don't have any marketing pitches and any of that. We try to reverse the coin and say, hey, would you be interested in coming to an event that was sponsored by a partner where they would just be marketing their own their own programs, their own things, would you be, would that be a community event that you'd be willing to come? And once they realize that, wait, no, I would not feel comfortable in coming to that event. I would not feel comfortable in being there. That's when it, it takes them. And when they realize that, wait, I get now why you have the policy. Now that makes sense. It's just not explaining. It's not just saying we cannot do that for the sake of it. We cannot do it because we don't want to. We also explain why. I really like this idea of asking someone to put on a different hat, to say, you are not here representing your company. You're here as a peer member of the community. And just turn it around and put people into their empathetic shoes and say, what would it feel like to be on the other side of that? I think it is really, it's really helpful. Do you have this kind of hat discussion? Like, how do you make sure that people are coming in with, in, with the right 
like expectations, the right orientation. We do a lot of the same things. Uh, it actually goes all the way back to our community guidelines and house rules, where we specifically say the community is a no sales zone. And we make sure that our partners understand that applies to Anaplan too. The community is a place where we talk about solutions, and use cases, and best practices, and how to do this or that. And it's an, it's a level playing field where everybody can come in with their own experience, with the desire to learn and encourage and educate others. And that's what we expect for our partners in the forums or anywhere, and especially at events. And so those guidelines flow through into groups. Now, when we were doing more in-person events, we definitely were nervous about including partners because we don't have eyes on what's happening in quite the same way at an in-person event. So we dabbled for a while with, you can sponsor the food or, or things like that. But our partner marketing team eventually expressed concern about the fact that we were essentially only using our partners for their wallets. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and our partners were saying, hey, look, we'd love to speak. We know a lot of stuff. We're not just here to build our own business. We want to help. We want to be part of the community. And so when we started hearing that, we experimented with letting some of them in. And we definitely still keep an eye on who's asking to join, who wants to be involved, just like Kat was saying, like our partner marketing team knows which partners are going to be trying to get the sales and which one of them are, are much more interested in just contributing. So we work a lot with them, but by and large, we, we let the community police itself. If something is said that shouldn't have been said, somebody tends to say something about it and it doesn't it happen. It will bubble very often. back to you. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't happen very often, which is really nice. Yeah. Maria, do you have that same kind of no sales zone rule within your own community? Does that ring true to you? Yes, of course, like, like Aaron says, it all comes back to the spirit of the program, right, of the user group program. So the, the premise there is, let's get together, let's geek about process automation and BPMN, and let's get techy about it, and let's go into the deep dive architectural technical things, and let's keep it that way. And one of the things that I've seen that works very well when partners approach us is, as Kat and, and everyone has said, it begins with our own partner managers. First, we set, I set always the expectations with them before even getting in contact with our partner to make sure they also know what it's about. But once I'm, I'm with the partners, I always try to get someone from their engineering team on board. So because sales... Mm -hmm folks have a very specific interest <laughs> agenda and and drive but then if you can if i can pair with someone from their engineering team to either co-host or be the leader directly instead of someone from the sales team from the partner side then it all those possible frictions disappear because the engineering folk won't, doesn't have that yeah. sales hat They've on. got a different orientation, e yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I've seen that really helps when I can bring in someone from another department uh, in the, from the sales, uh, from the partner uh, group. I love that idea. I am so on board for that. That is really <laughs> smart. The other thing I want to go deeper with you on is how do you have those communications with your own partner relationship staff inside your organization? How do you communicate that? Because they're not community people necessarily either. And so they don't always get this. How do you basically brainwash those people to understand the kinds of relationships you're trying to build? And if that was a little bit too much for you, and I'm going to give you a moment to think about that. Does anyone else want to jump in on that one? Like, how do they communicate that? internally because i find often many of my biggest challenges are internal communication challenges in that i didn't set the right expectations within my organization i could jump in on that one go for, for me, a cat. yeah for me what's helped when i first joined here at thoughtspot one of the things that i first did was actually align with our partner marketing and really talk to them about hey what what does our partner landscape so during my onboarding i had the opportunity to have that sync and learning about our partner ecosystem, that's when I started developing kind of a criteria 
so that everyone internally can be on the same page on what we're looking for if we have a partner involved in user groups. So documentations and going back to our community guidelines have really helped set those expectations and make sure that across the board internally, we're having the same conversations and we're looking for the same things. What Maria pointed out earlier about actually going outside of the sales team was actually a really great thing that I actually listed in one of my requirements was that we need to have someone that has been a partner with us for more than six months so that they we know that this is someone that's invested with community here for a long term. They need to have at least one to two certified people so that we can lean on them for any expert um, talks or deliveries or maybe training sessions that they are they may be interested to leading. So having that documentation and guidelines and communicating that back to the internal stakeholders that I've been reaching out to to work and identify these partners have helped me out a lot. And I just love having some documentations in place and making sure that it's always just, hey, this person didn't follow our criteria and per what we discuss, this is what I'm referring to. And now we have to take these next steps. And luckily that hardly is ever the case, but just a safe guardrail for us more. So there's some great questions coming in through the, <clears throat> the chat. I'm going to take the first one and read it out on behalf of Danny, who is enjoying lunch. So Danny Brinkley asks, does anyone have a standardized community participation program as part of say a premier partnership? So for example, in order to gain partnership status, that partner must run a user group chapter, host a certain number of events per year. Does anyone basically build this like almost requirement of being part of a community into the program with partners? I can go for that one. We don't have that specifically for partners. We do have a super user program within the company, the community, and that's one of the requirements. So they have, mm. we have several fields that they can be part of. One of them is events, but we do not have that just specifically for partners. It's for every community member. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I go for it. Go for it. Sorry. Like Kat, we don't have that as a requirement for partners at all. We like to leave it whoever wants to do it. However, for the champions program, it's to become one, you have to, there are many things that you can do. And one of them is being an event and a meetup leader, let's say, right. but it's optional as well. If, because there's people that feel really comfortable leading sessions and there's folks that they just love pull requests and they are a superstar on the forum. So we, depending on the personality of each community member, we offer different ways to become a champion, but that is listed there as a possibility to get there. So having this sort of as a menu item, but yeah, I think my worry about this is having someone say, oh, I, want, I really want that status for other reasons, but they're not actually an event person. And it just, some people are not. And so to be cautious about, yeah, having someone move into a role where they're just not going to be a good fit is something I guess we should be cautious around. I think having it as a menu of options sounds pretty wise though. I've got another question here coming in from my co-host Tally, who says, so we've talked a little bit about this being a no sales zone for most of our communities, but come on, the partners got a benefit. So let's be really explicit. Why do your partners participate. What do they get out of it? I want to hear that. Aaron, you're currently off mic, so you go first. Yeah, I. this is one that we take a, a what's in it for me approach to this as well, especially, and this goes back to your previous question about, about how we govern some of these things. And I think for us, we try to show, look, you don't have to get into this event or hop into this group and actively sell in order to get benefit from this. You showing up, showing your expertise, talking about how much when showing that you're the expert on this has an intrinsic benefit to it. And it honestly is less gross than just coming right out and saying, I'm amazing. Come buy my stuff. You can show that this stuff and people will come to you as a result. And we've built up enough goodwill with our partners over not just the groups program, but our community events where our partners are invited to speak um, along the same guidelines that they know, like they know when they get involved in these things that we do a lot to make them look successful, position them well. We have a lot of processes that we run them through to make sure that when they show up and present at this event, they are fully prepared and they can come off looking really great. Nice. Anyone else have a, some, a take on that? 
Yeah. To echo what Aaron was already saying, it's much easier for them to really showcase that they are the expert in our platform when they are presenting and in front of other customers. But we also say to have this as a resource for your customers that you're already working with and continue to build those relationships and connect them to others that are in the area. So not only is it a benefit to the partner to build their profile um, and expertise, it's also a benefit for who they're working and building those relationships on site with. We also tell them internally here, the people that I'm working with, partner marketing and the channels, I also let them know how great of a job they're doing. I give them the special shout outs of what this person, this partner has been phenomenal to work with. I can't be doing all of these activities without them on site. And that also just just gives them status and leverage to be seen by the channel that they're working with internally here. And of course, they also hopefully, if they are inspired and want to be a part of it, all of the super user programs that we mentioned here, that's also another perk if they're really wanting to obtain that next status of, hey, I want to be the next ambassador, or I want to be the next champion here. So those are some of the perks on how we try to motivate them, but usually it's mostly finding that intrinsic motivation for them to want to participate. So I want to bring Alex on next with a question around, again, in that sales question where we start navigating that that dance where we're about community, but also partners are making money here. How do we figure that part out? So Alex, if you want to go in. Yeah, like I just said, how do you navigate when they there may be a solution that is a sales or a purchasable solution or a, an added consulting service, for instance, or an added an add on that maybe that partner sells, where it's this will solve your issue. If you pay money, which we sell, it may not be out of the box solution. So there's that is a sales pitch, but it's also not I know for us, it's very subjective of if you're just coming in saying, Oh, we have a connector, we sell this thing, go buy it versus here's an explanation of why we sell this, what it is and what it does. But I'm curious if you guys have any experience they want to share on that. Yeah, Alex, yeah. And I especially yeah. see that challenge between the gap between selling services yeah. versus a product. Yeah, like we can customize that for you if you pay us money or a consulting service versus I'm asking how to do it myself in the community. Maria, yeah, wanna go ahead? I want to say that I think it's also how they present the topic and it's something that we, that it sometimes takes some time to tweak depending on the partner if, for example, as I said at the very beginning, we have partners that have been part of the community way before they became partners. And probably they see themselves as community members, pure community members first, than partners with them. There's no, there's no question about that. When the partner is maybe newer to the community, even before, let's say, letting them become a, an organizer or a leader, I tell them, why don't you join a couple of, of meetups before you become one? Just so you get a sense of how they are run, what kind of sessions they are presented, what's the tone that is used there. And I let them join, or I rather I invite them to join sessions led by community members, pure community members, and also by other partners. So they can sense that, that thing that it's very hard to put on words and that it will be easier for them to see rather than me trying to explain what they cannot do because there's so many nuances. So I think that's where, or that's how I navigate those, those tricky situations. And also whenever I realize that there's a partner, already a leader, a meetup leader, that's going, that's not really adhering to what the, the guidelines that we set first, there's some nudging, there's some friendly reminders, and there's obviously a whole process built to offboard them graciously, mindfully, which is also, I think it's something super important to have in mind, how to close that chapter <laughs> without losing the relationship, because mm -hmm. there's so much at stake and it's so delicate, you know? This is where I desperately want, of course, your, your stories of, have you had an experience where a partner was heading off the rails and you had to like either gently nudge them or remove their train completely from the tracks? Mm -hmm. Anyone want to be brave and tell us a story, of course, anonymously about having to go through that experience? Oh, go, go, Maria. 
I can go after you, Katarina, please. <laughs> no, I was just mentioning that thankfully we never had, at least that I recall, to offboard any partner completely from the user groups. However, we did, we do have to make some friendly like reminders once in a while. Hey, remember what we mentioned? This is not for for like commercial purposes. You need to be careful with what you say and how you say it. So uh, we never had to thank God like offboard anyone. But friendly reminders for sure. Right. And one yeah, of the I've things that we it. Sorry, did, oh, sorry, just to give you an example, it can be as simple as on the event page that the organizers create, they add their logo, their company logo. It can be as simple as this or actually promote one of their services during the, the events. I yeah. do have one. <laughs> But it was it wasn't traumatic at all. <laughs> I mean, offboarding sounds so strong. Sunsetting also sounds so strong. But rather it, and that's why I love our community. They came to me saying, "Hey, I we need your help because we're on the side of meetups. We're also organizing webinars, and we want to pick your brain on how to make them more successful. How to we want to get more engagement there, etc." And we started talking, how many, how often do you do them? All these things, no? And it turns out that really what they were trying to put their focus and their attention was in webinar pitches and sales pitches. And I said, hey, what? why are you dividing your attention and your efforts in trying to feed a user group and a webinar on a monthly basis where your, your organization is a size, it's, they were, they're not very big. Why don't you just focus your efforts where you think you will get more profit? And my offer to you is participate in other kinds of forums, participate as a speaker in, uh, off and on in other user groups where you can go and showcase your use case or your amazing experience with this and this customer, but unburden yourself of the organizer hat and they were quite happy about it and i said yes you're right i think we can do that fortunately for, for us that user group was co-hosted so it was easy to keep that user group rolling but they stepped down of course we sent out a message saying hey thank you they are stepping down because that's also super important whenever any leader steps down for whatever reason, work-wise, it's not in the race interest anymore, bandwidth, maternity leaves, maternity leaves. There's so many things that can happen that sometimes people just need to step down, that we're always making sure that they get the recognition as well they deserve at the end of it. So it was enough boarding, but it wasn't so, it wasn't nasty <laughs> at all. I know, I've always found that when I have a chapter that is a little bit not it, where I want it to be in a little bit more of a sales direction, it, I, it usually happens in two ways that the group kind of peters out. One, I'm going to give it a little bit less promotion. I'm not going to get that email newsletter fired up and direct, direct people towards it. I'm like, that's not my star example event. I'm just not going to give it as much love essentially from head office. And then the other part of that is community members know when they walk into an event that doesn't feel good to them and and they're just not going to go they're going to go to one event and they're like that was not what i wanted and and so those salesy kinds of chapters also tend to close themselves pretty quickly because the members are also very clear and saying not for me no thank you and yeah i've once or twice had to close chapters saying sorry like this is a little bit off where this community wants to be like mm -hmm. thank you so much but I need you to walk away, but generally I let them walk away of their own accord. I agree with you there, Elijah. I think one thing I'll add is that to help prevent some of these uncomfortable settings that our community members may feel when there is a sales kind of motion or just a sales environment feeling is that during the onboarding is that we also set an expectation that they'll help source customer leaders as well so that way there is not just a dominant leadership of the user group of just being partners we also have them try to source a customer leader if they're if they're launching mm -hmm. and helping 
put together the local user group. So that way there's also an offset of, okay, it's not just a partner leading it. It's also a customer and it's a colleague. It's someone that I feel comfortable with. And also yeah. we see this customer being able to put the, for lack of a better word, partner in check in case it does go into that direction. So that was something I learned in the hard way when I was first in the user group environment and I heard of partners almost reaching out to people when they had the registration list. I was like, no, moving forward, if a partner does want to be involved, they also have to be a part of the recruitment of user group leaders, not just for speakers, but for customers being a part of the leadership team as well to help offset. That's super fascinating. I have never done that at the chapter leader level, but that's my rule for if you're going to do a salesy product focused event, I'm like, that's fine. If you're really clear in the description that you're going to be talking about a specific product or service, as long as the event description is not a bait and switch, that's fine. But I also always have the rule to say, I never want to have a vendor there by themselves. I'm always like, bring a client in, have them do five minutes about their own experience because I want to have the community voice within the event. But I think bringing that up to the chapter leadership level is even smarter. I'm totally stealing that idea. That's great. Go ahead. It it works in our favor because partners tend to be sometimes in, in the past experience I've had tend to be some of our first user group leaders, especially internationally. So they end up having to be those kind of first head on the, they're the first people there. So they're the first people that'll help us making sure that we're getting customers involved. So once we started seeing that partners internationally were wanting to be involved too. That's when we started setting the expectation of, okay, help us with your customer relationships you're building or with the people on site, because I'm not able to travel to every user group, unfortunately. I wish I could, but it's just not feasible. Having them be able to be our eyes and ears and sourcing some customers while they're being the leaders in the meantime is ha actually helped us a lot. Excellent. Has anyone else sort of set like some kind of uh, like leadership, like rules around who should be in the chapter leader and what roles and like backgrounds they come from to help give the right mix of, of perspectives to their chapter leadership? Yeah, I can chime in on that. We've been working on making some transitions in that area for a while because our when our group's program was in its infancy, it was really a straight offshoot of customer success. And so we had customer success employees running the groups themselves. And they would treat it like a, an extra communications channel from the company to their customer, which can work sometimes, but we've made a really big push to external leadership in the last few years, which is where the partners have been so critical because they're a lot more willing to step up than customers have been, uh, at least mm -hmm. at our stage of maturity. But we have that foundation of employee leadership that like, I don't want employees being the only leader it's way too easy for them to let a group go when their bandwidth gets tight. They do great at serving as a liaison with a partner or a customer leader. So we always, I at least always like to have somebody who's the point person from inside the company besides me co-leading with a customer or a partner in case they need extra support or so that they can attend the events too and just be there to be eyes and ears. So that's worked really well for us so far. Yeah. And Aaron, my experience has totally been that staff are the worst chapter leaders because the, the community part of it always falls off at the, the very end of their long queue of work to be done. And therefore it just, it never happens. Yeah. It's the same here. So it's really interesting because whenever we need to kickstart a group, or if we see that we have a really strategic location that we need to, to start, we always try to find community leaders to lead them, but sometimes we don't have that connection immediately. So we try to find someone internally that could lead the group, but we always say that this is temporary. You can start, you can help kickstart it, but once it's live, once it's going, we need to recruit someone from the community because our main goal is to have community-led events. And if we have people, internal people, even though they are experts and they know what they're doing, it's not from the community. So that's always something that we try to do. So whenever we need, we have someone kickstart from the company, we always try to bring co-organizers and then eventually the internal people that were leading the group just start slowly going away. And it starts right. to be like community-led. Because it's community-led, because if they just want to hear from your organization, you also have a webinar program for that. Like, you know, exactly. you don't need to recreate that thing that exists. Exactly. So I've got a question coming in here from Anissa, 
I was just wondering, do you have a cap on the number of customers you can have in a, in a user group? Do you find like it gets sometimes to a size where it becomes unmanageable? Oh, I've never actually yeah. encountered that problem. Catherine, take it. Okay, so it's not just for customers, it's for organizers in general. We try not to have user groups with more than four organizers because we know that it gets just too crowded, too many opinions, too many people just jumping in. So we always try to cap at three, four tops, like three to four organizers per group. And we always try to, to be as diverse as possible, meaning that we try not to have four people or three people from the same company. So that's something that we do not do, or at least we try really hard not to. Yeah, I actually have a rule for mine, which is that it can't all be from the same company. Like they actually need to say, oh, maybe you've got another partner you work with. You need to bring them in because I find that. And also, yeah, I also have the same rule, which is I can have no more than three actual organizers of a chapter. They can have loads of other volunteers and contributors, but decision makers, maximum three, because otherwise people just spend all their time in committee meetings and nothing actually ever gets done. <laughs> yeah, that's really important. And something else that we do whenever we are working with organizers like partners or specific companies that we try to recruit to be organizers, we always try to have only one point of contact. So in the mm. initial meetings, we have three, four people coming in, wanting to understand the program, all of them jump in to help, but then we set the rules and say, hey, this is really amazing that you all want to be part of it, but to make things easier, you need to select one. I need to have one point of contact and you can all be part of it outside. Like you can be on the background, help out, but we need to have just one point of contact. I'm not going to reach out to everyone and wait for everyone to give their input to start making things happen. Like just give me one person. Yeah. I call that person the benevolent dictator of my chapters. Um, what do you call that, the lead person on your chapter? I guess, like, could I clarify my question? Absolutely, thank you, go ahead. Yeah, so the way we have our user group set up was intended for them to one day be in person. So we set them up geographically. And now, it's two years later, they're still completely remote. They're conducted over Zoom and we haven't yet migrated to that in-person feel. And I just joined our team. So I'm trying to remind everyone that we have these user groups and drive attendance. And right now they sit around like seven to 14 customers joining the call. And then we'll have four to five of our employees on the call. And they're only 45 minutes. And we really want to drive dialogue, not so much have it centered on a presentation because like y'all said earlier, we have webinars for that stuff. So where I'm trying or currently trying to navigate is expanding to our APAC region. And they gave me their distribution list and they want to invite 350 people. And I know there's a 40% click rate. We probably will only get maybe 80 but I'm just a little nervous to go in and navigate that hug with 80 people when I'm used to having 14 at max. So, so your question, uh -oh. Oh, I was just going to say to clarify, then your question, is there a max that we normally put for customers joining a virtual user group or a virtual chapter in this instance then? Yes, that's a much better way to phrase it. Got it. No, I, I haven't put and luckily we've been actually been fortunate enough that our community, they actually sit most of the time for a full like 90 minute virtual user group. And some of them we, yeah, we've had some great turnout and requests for more of them, but we keep it pretty much once a quarter. So we want to make sure that they're not burnt out. We do allow some Zoom breakouts and there's other engagement platforms. I know like Meetsy and other ones where breaks down the engagement more one-to-one -one that helps you match those people so that you're not manually matching people yourself. But if you're almost struggling to, to see if you can make sure that you're moderating the event, I would definitely lean on those four employees that you're inviting to these events to help you with moderation, to help you with the waiting room if you're using Zoom, or to help you with the breakouts and such. And also make them some of those breakout leads to help them create the dialogue. Yeah. It's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm sure Maria has uh, other tips, but those are just off the top of my head when I'm thinking here too. But that's exciting that your team is excited to invite more customers. I'm all for it and keep us posted on how APAC grows.
Yeah, it will. And hopefully our like North American ones continue to grow as well. I want them to be bigger. I'm just a little intimidated. <laughs> Don't be. It's a very exciting journey, let's say. And as Scott said, be very mindful on the agenda. My, yeah, my advice would be th think through the agenda so that even a virtual gathering can have that sense of community as well, which is harder to craft in a virtual environment, but harder doesn't mean impossible. It just takes a little bit more effort from the organizers. And I've seen a comment saying about the Zoom breakout sessions, a cat made a great comment saying leverage on the um, volunteers from your company to lead those sessions, have even an on-conference setup, also a panel, uh, discussion groups. Make sure that if the group is so big, you put more effort into those details because it will make the difference. In, in smaller setups, uh, it's easier to have this one-to-one -one, uh, kind of relationships and build the networking. That's also what people that what drives people into these user groups, right? It's the networking as well, and right. You, it's easier in person events, but it's also possible to do it in in virtual setups. It just requires uh, more tweaking. So, okay. Yeah, and I think something else that we can do because it you're talking about a group that's really big, right? So in a smaller group, it's easier to interact with everyone and get people to speak. Even now, Elijah is trying to get people to come for and speak, and we're only like 15 here. So try to also have a few icebreakers or a few questions that you can ask and try to call people by their name and say, hey, you've been really quiet. Is there something you want to share? Or I know that this is something that you benefit from. Maybe you want to step in and say something as well. So engage with them because having such a big event and then only having like just the speakers and not having that participation from the community can seem like weird. At least that's something mm -hmm. we've seen in the past. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to circle back and say, one, the curse of success. That's amazing. You're like, there might be too many people in my community event. They're like, the rest of us are all like, please let that be my problem. But I think, yeah, the way we can try and break it out into more conversational spaces can work. And I think ice breaking, breaking it out into breakout rooms can work for some people. But I also sometimes see that others react to say, oh, no, I got to learn a tangible thing for some audiences just the networking as much as they find value in it they'll never show up for it like you gotta basically say you're gonna learn these concrete skills and then we're gonna sneak the networking in there to keep people there in the community and i think the idea of doing something unconference style which maria was talking about which is to basically let your members set the topics and then say hey if you also want to talk about this head out into this breakout room i think it's a really great idea and you can try and set those topics ahead of time and you could do one or two of them, but I think the best topics always show up on the day of the event. So if you can leave some flexibility into your schedule that can work out really well for you. We're also, of course, coming up towards an end here. So I'd like to basically say thank you so much, everyone for coming in, asking questions, putting our guest experts on the spot. Um, and before I let them all go, I just want to give them one last chance to leave us with, with one insight. Inspire me. What is one thing that I need to be like thinking about in this next week? Cat's laughing, which means Cat gets to go first. One thing that I want to replicate here when we go in person is leveraging the power of our user groups and our community leaders to give back to the community. And that's something that I saw back at my time at Alteryx where our user group leaders were passionate about giving back. So they actually had user groups focused on supporting or volunteering with a nonprofit and actually leveraging our said platform to help them with their data analysis. So inspiration maybe something to think about when we do in persons is also leveraging your user group leaders and connecting with them to see hey what kind of events do you guys want to do what are some things we could switch up from the standard user group meetings that we've had and that's something that i'm hoping and eager to get back to when we're all back in person for these events here love it katarina you go next i was just trying to find something really inspirational to tell kat just gave an amazing <laughs> speech yeah so i don't know if i have anything just super inspiring to say it's just 
go get it, try to do it. Don't be afraid of failure. Just take it and learn from it because we've done a lot of things in the past and a lot of mistakes. We tried to mess with breakout films in the beginning and it was a mess. Kat was there as well. So Kat used to work with Mad Out System. So she knows the mess. It's like we were creating groups. Every It was insane, but we learned from it. So just go and learn from it and that's it and get better. I don't think I have anything other than that to say. Just go. I'm inspired on. already. Thank you. Aaron, now it's over to you. Yeah, I think thinking back to a few of the things that we've talked about today, the, the biggest thing that I would say is the transparency is important with your members, making sure they feel as safe as possible. Hey, we're bringing in partners and we're letting you know about it. We're also letting you know that they're not going to be selling to you. Or if, or if to go back to an earlier question, if, if a partner does have a solution that's unique to them, just call it out and say, this is a thing, it exists we're not pushing you for it. All of those kinds of things can really help just community wide to let your members know you're on their side and let your partners know, hey, we're in your camp too. We're just trying to make this the right space for everyone. So again, transparency is my biggest thing. Love it. So we've got transparency, we've got setting clear expectations and don't be afraid of failure. And Maria, over to you, bring it all together. <laughs> I know, I'm a bit of a jerk, sorry. <laughs> I would say give your user leaders, the meetup leaders, the shout out and the recognition and the public recognition whenever you can. They are out there driving amazing things for on behalf of our companies. And yeah, just give the shout out every time you can, either you know, social networks, whenever you have a summit, uh, make sure you give them that love and that public recognition because they deserve it. And the other thing will be also challenge them and give them constant things that they can may, uh, try out in their user groups. Some, sometimes we become very comfortable in the ways we do things, but challenge them to change one thing, to try one new thing, as Katarina said, the breakout rooms. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid if there's too many people. Don't be afraid if there's very few people joining. Try to uh, yeah, challenge them as well. So shout outs and challenge them. Love it. With that, we're going to wrap it all up. Thank you so much all for sharing your expertise. Thank you so much to all the attendees who jumped in, asked questions, and gave us their time. We're going to probably do another event next month. Who can say? So be sure to join us in the Slack group, and I will take this recording and share it out in that same Slack group later this week as well. And with that, have a lovely day. Thank you all.